I call my synthesis the system's view of life because it requires this new kind of thinking that we know as systems thinking. Thinking in terms of relationships, in terms of patterns, in terms of context. As you know, um, thinking in terms of relationships is crucial for ecology because ecology uh, derived from the Greek oikos, meaning household, ecology is the science of the relationships among the various members of the earth household. Now, I should also mention that systems thinking is not limited to science. Many indigenous cultures embody profound ecological awareness and think of nature in terms of relationships and patterns. They would use certain uh, metaphors or certain myths to express their view of nature. They wouldn't speak scientific language, but the basic intuition is the same. And I'd also like to mention that over the last 10 years or so, I've been fascinated by the science of Leonardo da Vinci, the great genius of the Renaissance, which was a science of living forms, of interconnected patterns and processes. And in my book, The Science of Leonardo, I argue that Leonardo da Vinci was a systemic thinker, an ecologist, and a pioneer of eco-design and biomimicry. Now, in modern science, Systems thinking emerged in the 1920s and 1930s from a series of interdisciplinary dialogues among biologists, psychologists, and ecologists. And in all these fields, scientists realized that a living system, an organism, a social system, or an ecosystem is an integrated whole whose parts cannot be, um, whose properties cannot be reduced to the properties of its parts. So the so-called systemic properties are properties of the whole that none of the parts have. So systems thinking involves a shift of perspective from the parts to the whole. And the early systems thinkers expressed this in the now well-known phrase, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Now, system science also tells us that all living systems share a set of common properties and principles of organization. And this means that systems thinking can be applied to integrate academic disciplines, which, as we well know, are very fragmented at the time. So we can integrate them by discovering similarities between different phenomena within the broad range of living systems. So for instance, you can talk about the health of a human being or the health of a city. You can talk about the stress level in a community or a stress level in an economy. These are properties that are similar in, in different systems. networks, they're much more connected than they were in the past. If you look at how we make policy decisions in banks, so this is um, a chart from the World Bank, but what it shows is it shows the different U.S. banks prior to the bailout. And these numbers that you see between things like this 456 and this 94, and this is Lehman Brothers, not Lehman Sisters here, right? These, the size of the numbers show sort of how correlated stock prices are in the tails. And so a big number here means if something bad is happening to AIG, that means something bad will happen to Merrill Lynch. So when you looked at sort of this network, what you see is it's not just that we can draw lines between these different financial institutions. It's that some of these lines are stronger than others. And when we think about a particular financial you know, entity, we can't just think in terms of its own balance sheet. We have to think in terms of how it affects something else. So when you talk about complexity, what we mean is we mean things that are connected in sort of deep ways. So a couple years ago, I was involved in a project to try and figure out what's causing obesity, and we solved it. There it is, just a simple solution. Now, if you drill, obviously you can't read this, that's on purpose. 
If you drill down, what you see, there's different colors in here. So for media, social, economic, food, activity, infrastructure, so everything from lack of sidewalks to large Coca-Colas, everything you can think of is sort of in this graph. But the point is, is that no one, we look at the big picture, no one could possibly understand obesity. We now have so much knowledge, so much information, we recognize there's so much complexity in the world that one person can't do anything anymore, right? If you really want to sort of solve obesity, understand it, you need teams of experts in order to do it. So when we say something's complex, what we mean is that it's between ordered and random. It's not simple, it's not completely random. Or another way we put it is we say that it's deep. It's something that's difficult to explain, engineer, right, or predict, or evolve, right? So the brain is very difficult to explain. It was extremely difficult to evolve, right? And if you tried to engineer a brain, that would be difficult. And so we would therefore say the brain is complex, right? We wouldn't say a coffee table is complex, right? Because it's none of those things. So if you look at economic phenomena, some of them are complex and some of them aren't. So oil production isn't that complex, right? It pretty much grows in a linear fashion with economic growth. Oil prices, because you can have inventories, you can have tankers just cycling outside of ports waiting for the prices to go up or down, right? Those are complex. Systems thinking is vital because complexity is the thing that all policy makers and decision makers are telling us that is the issue that they face. We give our students a very rounded education and that involves issues of sustainability and business ethics uh, as well as business being about just profit. Well, today it is becoming ever more evident that concern with the environment is no longer one of many single issues. It is the context of everything else, of our lives, our businesses, our politics. The great challenge of our time is to build and nurture sustainable communities, designed in such a manner that their ways of life, their businesses, economies, physical structures, and so on, do not interfere with nature's inherent ability to sustain life. Now, if we want to do this seriously, the first step naturally needs to be to understand how nature sustains life. And it turns out that this involves a whole new ecological understanding of life. Indeed, such a new understanding of life has emerged in science over the last 30 years or so. At the forefront of contemporary science, the universe is no longer seen as a giant machine consisting of some elementary building blocks. We have discovered that the material world ultimately is a network of inseparable relationships, patterns of relationships. We also have discovered that the Earth as a whole is a living, self-regulating system. The view of the human body as a machine and of the mind as a separate entity is now being replaced by one that sees not only the brain but also the immune system, the bodily tissues and even every single cell as a living cognitive system. Evolution is no longer seen as a competitive struggle for existence, but rather as some kind of cooperative dance in which creativity and the constant emergence of novelty are the driving forces. And with the new emphasis on complexity, networks, nonlinearity, and patterns of organization, a new science of qualities is now slowly emerging.